Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 613, that's 613 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you're doing marvellous. How am I? Pretty, pretty good, all things considered. It is now day 25 of Sober October. The end is fast approaching. This is the last full week of Sober October and I cannot wait for it to end. As much as I'm enjoying it, I'm also looking forward to having a bit of a drink and having other things, <laughs> you know what I mean? But in general, it has definitely been a great experience. I cannot lie. So much so that I'm at the point now where I'm thinking going forward i may alternate one month on one month off maybe two months on or maybe one month on two months off kind of thing in terms of drinking and doing drugs because i've realized during this whole entire time that i've been wasting so much of my time um you know recovering from heavy sessions and whatnot and if you know me you know i go hard in the paint when i'm not going hard in the paint i'm working but then when i'm going hard in the paint i'm going hard in the paint but unfortunately as the years progress your ability to bounce back is just not the same i'd imagine it'd be the same thing if i had an injury god forbid don't get an injury but i'd imagine my bounce back ability from injuries are not the same probably when i fall down i probably won't recover the same or even stand up the same so it's no surprise that drinking copious amounts of alcohol and doing untold amounts of drugs as the age progresses is probably not a good um, recipe for longevity or a recipe for just health and wellness in general. So, and because I'm not at a point now where I kind of want to give up nightlife because I still am intrinsically linked to it, especially with my DJing thing that I'm doing on the side and just my love of clubs and going out in general, I need to find a way to make it manageable for me. At the moment, sober raving isn't really my thing at the moment because i'm not really enjoying being in parties sober to be honest it's not really something that i would do in my free time i think i'm more likely to go to a gig sober which i've done plenty of times than to go to a rave it's just not the right place for it um i, I don't feel comfortable i kind of get in a mood when people start bumping me and stepping my toes and just being belligerent which is not the best thing to do because people are in there to do that kind of thing so going in and having that kind of mood is a bit of a vibe killer and the last thing i want to do is be a vibe killer 21 in those kind of spaces because i know what that's like so in order for me to have a good time i need to kind of find out a good balance and for now i think the good balance for me is to be super strict monday to friday then when i'm going out i'm going out but just keep it to one day and then for the most part long term just go with the whole you know one one month on one month off kind of thing because number one it saves money and number two it saves my brain cells and in terms of productivity in terms of productivity, come on, man. I've been pumping out the podcast. I've been doing the live streams. I've been writing a bunch. I've done even some DJ mixes here and there, like things that I was not doing prior. I've had time to do it because I'm not hungover. I don't have that brain fog. I don't feel like I'm about to kind of, you know, collapse into my flipping legs as I go out. No, I feel strong. I feel ready to go. Of course, the dieting's working too. The working out's working too. All those things are working, but I need to kind of ramp it up and kind of make it a lifestyle thing and less of a kind of you know challenge sort of thing going forward and i know i'm definitely going to do that especially with my up and coming trips i'm going to do to some far-flung places to go and rave and party and all that good stuff but i am looking forward to it to end because i think that first drink is going to be so tasty abstaining from something from that long and then having it for the first time is always great because it tastes amazing the first time or it tastes really horrible um it's the same thing when you quit sugar and then you have like a biscuit for the first time you just you quickly realize how sugary those things are so it's quite cool to be able to do that going forward so let's see wild one let's see wild one anyway apart from that many things to jump into and talk about i don't want to waste too much more of your time so let's just jump into it and talk about these things straight away number one thing i wanted to mention was this new nightclub that's opened up in the uk specifically in london called beams which is spearheaded by the same people who helped to open and run printworks when it first launched and now they've kind of pivoted away from printworks and they're now doing uh, beams and that company is called london warehouse projects also known as lwe and from what i've seen the beams in the pictures and whatnot it looks pretty spectacular I am one of those people who has a bit of a soft a bit of a soft space in my heart for these big mega club type places. I think they serve 
they're just as important as your underground 500 capacity 100 capacity venues i think the ability to put on a production of this scale on a weekly basis with some of the biggest acts in the world and have it be safe and have it be entertaining all that kind of stuff to appeal to normies is something that i think is super in, in, in important i feel like these raves play an integral part into the overall ecosystem of nightlife and in general i just like the little change of it i like to go to like i said a dingy underground basement bar somewhere with crappy sound system and terrible equipment but a really talented person playing behind the decks and i also like to go somewhere where the dj isn't that impressive but the lights are amazing and they have fog machines and all this sort of malarkey i'm a big fan of it but the only thing that i don't like about these mega clubs especially when this normies involved is this culture of just trying to capture every Every single moment look at the sea of fucking mobile phones staring at the fucking dj and of course the, the the way the stage is set up the way they've kind of set up the entire room or the space itself cause itself or lends itself for people to get these really cool pictures and there's something i remember reading someone says something when they go when it goes into production they actually think about how people are going to film it they think about how it looks in landscape how it looks in portrait because i guess most people hold their phone up in a portrait mode to get instagram stories and stuff and they build their production or their live sets and rigs based on that kind of idea so it makes sense why this thing is kind of a square with this sort of ring and these sort of lights that kind of beam into the djs as they're playing behind there it makes them look like they're in some sort of sci-fi film or something thing with a bevy of their hangers on at the background and all of them happen to be dudes every single one of them right capturing content capturing content capturing content it's just like how much is enough and you're going to a place like this you've got your nice little fade on you're enjoying yourself you probably ketted up and maybe peeled up and got some drinks in you and instead of just enjoying it absolutely absorbing the event you spend all your time pointing your phone at the fucking djs and basically looking at them perform through your phone which is pretty redacted but also, it's funny because you see people doing this, but then you hear people taking the piss out of people like myself who maybe stay at home sometimes and watch DJ live streams on YouTube. This is watching a live stream and going to a rave and watching a rave through your phone. They're probably on the same level of corny and lame and a bit losery. They're probably on the same level. If anything, staying at home watching a stream is less, lo less losery, less corny and less lamey because you're staying at home. But if you've decided to get ready you know, get a babysitter, uh, book an Airbnb, stay in a hotel, get dressed, get a haircut, get your toes did, nails did, and you go there only to just point the phone at the stage. So look through your camera screen at the DJ who's playing in front of you or the artist. That's a bit of a waste of money and a waste of time. But in general, you can't really, you know, be too hard on this because these kind of venues do attract people who like to do this kind of thing. And if you're LWE and you want to appeal to the um, the, the common folk, the normies, quote unquote, the non sceny people who I think in general do keep the scene afloat. I think we've basically seen, especially now post pandemic, how important that kind of normie fan was. That person that's just, you know, after a Friday night at work um, is struggling for places to go after the party hub and they just pop into x or y or they pop into phonics um they pop into mix or to color factory they pop into all these little places just to just to kind of extend the night they don't really care who's playing but they just want to go somewhere where there's music playing and they've got alcohol you know serving at the bar that's all they want and those people i think basically um kept the scene alive in some regards and of course all the foreigners too especially some of our brothers and sisters in the eu in places like france germany and obviously uh, spain and stuff but now now we're outside the EU and it's a bit difficult to come back in and a lot of those people also just went back home and decided to kind of you know settle down over there it really has changed what these scenes and what these clubs look like in general but you can definitely tell it's thinned out a lot look at pictures from like 2018 to 2019 to now and it's not the same and maybe it has to do with just the general cost of living as well do you know what I mean people maybe just have don't have the money to kind of spend to kind of go to a rave because in general going to a rave it doesn't matter if you go abroad or you stay in the uk especially if you're going to indulge in some of the adult you know materials you're essentially going to spend anywhere between 50 to 100 dollars before you've even had a drink sometimes just on your ticket and the adult materials then once you add all the drinks and stuff and maybe an uber bag or maybe a cheeky mcdonald's on the way home you might be looking at 200 quid 
for what how long entertainment you're really having you're only out for maybe six hours maybe you spend four of those hours on the dance floor actually on the dance floor if you add it all together it's not that great value for money to be fair so maybe if you go in there and you you know you pay that money you're probably involving your rights to just point your phone at the thing and because you're gonna say look like that fucking denzel washington um me minute i'm gonna leave you with something I'm going to leave you with something. I'm from around the way. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're definitely going to leave you with something after paying 50 quid to see people play. But that aside, there's a review courtesy of Mixed Mag um, regarding Beams. I'm quickly going to read here just to kind of give you an idea of what it's about and to kind of talk about some things that they mentioned here in the article. It says as follows. Um, this is titled for Mixed Mag, actually, a review of Beams' opening party. Um, it's not an overstatement to say we're experiencing a, cri- a crisis in nightlife. The drum shed, Space 289, the cause, original home in Ashley Road, have all been shuttered in the last 12 months while Capital Club in Juggernaut Printworks looks to be closed for a number of years after its big NYD send-off as development to convert the Surrey Key site into offices goes forward. By the way, fuck Printworks, man. I went there recently. Great, I had a good time. But they sold me a fucking lemon. For the longest time, they kept telling us that that Dixon party or maybe a couple of others afterwards will be the last ones. And then they got a little extension and now it's heading all the way through to New Year's Day. Come on, man. They did they pulled a fast one they pulled the sports direct like you know last sale and um, everything must go and it kept being open for like years and years and years until it finally did close so clever people but fuck them it continues Baldwick, the team behind print work the drum sheds and more announced news of a new east london space back in june to the light of the cities that ravers desperate for some um resuscitation in the scene located within a sprawling estate of rundown warehouses the beam stands out immediately with its distinctive peeling paintwork array of exotic house plants and wide victorian windows the annoying thing about beams just to interject here is that it is if i'm not mistaken it's at the Tate and Lau factory which is near like canning town custom housey type area of royal victoria where i used to live right and where my parents used to live and where i kind of grew up chct stand up and it's really annoying these places because because they never, ever, ever, ever book people who are actually local from their area. There are plenty of people from their area who got their start playing on pirate radio, who have now transitioned to playing more dance music stuff, myself included, and you never see us playing in these places. Instead, they get people from far-flung places to play in these really grassroots local venues that are intrinsically tied to like the dance music heritage of East London. It would be great if they could kind of intermingle or interweave or join could whatever that word is some of the people that live locally to that place to actually tell the full entire story just building that place or setting that place up the way they did it is to me just like a, a, a weird rectangular symbol of gentrification in the club scene set your shop up wherever it may be but don't actually integrate the local community it's annoying but again who am i in it formerly a sugar factory run by tate and lao the venue has a surprisingly idyllic facade um delicate light flows from every direction okay cool you're sucking them off too much you continue here the venue's fifty-five thousand square foot expanse ensures a good chunk of your first visit is spent getting your bearings and staring around the bewilderment at its sheer scale this sounds like a bit of a paid job, to be fair. Spread across two mammoth club rooms, a small bar in a chiller area, plus an expansive courtyard. There's plenty of ground to cover. Like, let's be real. What's it actually going to look like? It's going to look like a big warehouse space with a good sound system inside it. You know, some exposed brick, right? Concrete, cables all over the place and shit. Like, what else is it going to look like? These guys are acting like they're walking into a Zaha Hadid building or something. Like It's not going to be that deep. The courtyard is located just past security, a flat concrete stretch brimming with food stores and seating areas and punters holding their phones aloft, trying to get a hold of their mates. Once inside, there's a con- confounding variation of areas to choose from. Tucks upstairs away from the pounding subs is room free, a stylish bar with comfortable sofas and a cocktail menu, perfect for stare out the window and recharge. In contrast, room two is reminiscent of the dingy underground heyday of a rave, dark ray filled with gems of light bouncing around this low ceiling making an intimate space for those who really want to stomp the opd lights of sub and Dallas flowers and max dean so there's three rooms in there now the main event room one slipping through the doors and along the venues glow red door corridors is an experience in itself to come face to face with this prestigious amphitheater of a dance floor even musically, the music here is less rave and more spectacle with Hot Sis 82 slamming into, slamming a heavy tech house inclined 
selection all brought to life by some choice of strobes and breathtaking backdrop of the sunset through the condensed um, condensated windows he's, fo he's followed by the headliner Michael Bibby who's illuminated with a dex by the ring of light shaped in the Elevate logo um, draped around him in all sides like a curtain each beam of the warehouse is strapped with his own lighting and sound system being meaning regardless of your position in the crowd you're still getting a full experience that's what I mean about them setting it up to be perfect for Instagram and shit you know what I mean like there's nothing blocking your line of sight unless these kind of beams or these i don't think are they called beams or these are beams i don't know what these are called um that go up so there's nothing blocking your line of sight elevated and stuff so it's pretty decently set up but that's a meaty crowd in it michael bibby shifts tickets you cannot deny that guy shifts tickets doesn't matter where he plays people will come out in their droves to come and see him that's a that's a lot of people that's probably the most i've seen in terms of pictures in terms of people being in clubs that's crazy. It turned flying in straight from my beef. Bibi rushed to the decks. I was getting a little stressed out in traffic, causing a delay and nervous at the time, he says. But stepping on the stage and hearing the roar from the crowd, as soon as I went melted all those fears away and reminded me while I was home. He adds, it was both exciting and the privilege to be able to host these first shows in a new space in my hometown. Being born and raised in London, huh? Where's he from? Is he from Croydon or is he actually from London? I don't know. Let's go. I was always considered the capital a leading cultural city for electronic music, so I was really happy when I got the call. This doesn't sound like somebody from London would say, in it? Leading cultural city. Or did he even write this? Or did his agent, like, he's probably getting out of his face. He didn't write it. He, he didn't say this. The Solid Cruise founder starts off strong with a pulsating bass of Beltram Smackio, um, earning a frenzied response from the crowd. Phones are waving, screams of fuck off. <laughs> God, I love tech house people, man. Honestly, you know, I love tech house people. As much as people hate them and shit, they have fun. And I know the phones are annoying and they're all wearing fucking Dior and Balenciaga sneakers and shit. And all the boys look the same and all the girls look the same with their makeup and their fake eyelashes and the dresses and shit. Whatever. Say what you want about them. But these motherfuckers have fun and they spend money. They buy tickets and they go out on the lash. They go out They go out specifically to spend as much money as possible. They don't go out on like, you know, people like the ones I know in the scene who go and buy fucking loads of tins before they enter the rave. They might be snick of cheeky vodka in. Do you know what I mean? They, they just drink water and orange juice at the bar. These guys actually buy. They buy flipping doubles. They're buying beers. They're buying rounds. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're probably buying some stuff in the street food section. They might even buy some merch if you got it for sale. They don't, they're not tight with their money whatsoever. And then when they're actually on the dance floor, they're having fun. They're dancing. They're making noises. They're singing along to bass lines. Like, when I went to Half Baked recently um, to see, I forgot his name. I keep forgetting his name, but it doesn't matter. But when I went to Half Baked recently, it was kind of a reminder of it. Like, don't get me wrong. The crowd is maybe a little bit sketchy. You don't want to step on certain people's toes or you might end up getting your face stomped in. But overall, everyone's really nice and everyone's there to have a legitimately a good time. There's not a lot of, like stunting and worrying about what you're wearing and shit obviously you can if you want to but everyone was kind of just chill and i kind of remember i kind of i kind of forgot what that was like to be in a place where people are chill and obviously because they're from my part of london in general the people that will be into that kind of tech house you see and it kind of you know filled my heart up with joy to see people who i kind of grew up with at those places but the phone thing man this is why you can't ever do Berlin in, in London. You can't do Berlin in London, the whole no the phones thing. You have to do it maybe in certain, you know, venues. But you can't do this because this is just not something, we just don't know about it. It's not something that we know about. It's not something that we care about. It's just, just not something that you can do here. No way. It's like trying to introduce no phones at somewhere like Dubai or something, right? Where it's all about show and materialism and I'm here, you're not kind of thing. It's just impossible to do. Look at that. There's like a sea of phones here. This picture of, I think, Hot Sense 82 playing behind the decks. It's just a sea of phones that he's facing. Just people dead ass looking at him. That's one of the things I have to say is being a DJ is really off putting. When you're playing and people are just staring at you, it's already worse for me when I'm playing in venues because there's hardly anyone there. So when you are looking at somebody, they kind of feel like you're holding them captive when you look at them. It's like, oh, hey, someone's look, someone's looking at me play. Don't leave, don't leave. When really you're just looking. But people have that weird thing. They see you looking like, oh, shit. Now you see me. Now I can't leave. But it's probably even worse if you're a relatively well-known person because just all you're going to have are all these faces just staring at you. They're just like, and they're all in a straight line looking at you directly. They're not looking anywhere else. They're not dancing. No one's got their back to you. They're just staring at you. 
<laughs> it's crazy he continues after the set bb said he felt incredible adding this show was almost so it was also the first time putting on my own elevate um brand showcase a concept based on the empowering and energizing people to reach their highest potential it seemed to work but what what does that mean that's like the kind of bio you'd see for a, a fitness clothing brand something on, on flipping instagram isn't it it says it says a lot, but what does it actually mean? A concept based on empowering and energizing people to reach their highest potential. What is that like a cat brand? Like what 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 is this? I don't get it. Anyway, a few days after the grand opening, Patrick Topin, who debuted alongside Dennis Salter at the Beams, summed up his experience in a new venue, tweeting, "Such an amazing addition to London UK scene." That is the biggest takeaway upon exit. Okay, cool. More, more, more from Patrick Turpin at ten, eh? <laughs> or Dennis Salter. Regardless of the preference of the scale of the venue, the Beams is an ambitious space which is benefit for the UK clubbing sphere and inspire those around the capital to follow suit. The Beams must just be the beacon of hope. London nightlife needed. This feels like payola to me. Like they paid for this and sponsored it, which is not a bad thing. But I think they should have kind of specified this. This is this is crazy. There's not one slight on this in terms of it being bad, accused, nothing. Just all too much praise. But, you know, these cover reviews do this kind of thing. So I guess I'm going to have to check it out for my own, um, you know, curiosity because I'm, I'm somebody who likes to see these things myself. I don't like just to go off the word of somebody else. So I'm definitely going to check it out. And so far, having checked the website, let's see what they got here. Let's actually give it a refresh and see if I miss anything out here. But the website itself, what they got coming up, they've got Hacienda Night coming up this weekend with everybody you would expect to see there at Hacienda Party. Um, they've got a Messier Plax Night. He's playing alongside De Bamboo, Ra Bamboo Rambo. I don't, Bambi Rambo, I don't know who that is. Dennis Horvat, I know, and a few other people I know here. Um, okay, move on from that one. And then the following week, you got Junction 2. I know a few people on there as well. It was pretty decent. And there's a Jamie Jones night on what? The Let 19th. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see the power because Michael Ruby sold his one out. Is Jamie Jones one still available? Yeah, they're all available, right? Tickets on sale. Let's see if the Jamie Jones one is still on sale because the Michael Bibby power of getting in there and selling tickets is quite incredible. Yeah, my, Jamie Jones one is still available in terms of tickets. Interesting. There was a time where you couldn't, there was no way you could buy tickets for Jamie Jones event so close to the event or something. You have to buy them way in advance, but I guess things change, innit? Things definitely change. Let's see what they've got here. Ah, no, they're not actually available, see? Okay, uh, it, it, he's still got the power. The tickets are not available. It says they're available, but if you look at the right-hand side, they've all been X'd out. Every release, first, second, third, fourth and fifth everything even pre-entry at 2 p.m oh yeah true it closes at half 10 doesn't it that's insane it actually closes at half 10 it's one of those kind of venues that opens at um what's it open at? it opens at uh 11 or something yeah there you go that's the time there 12 p.m to 10 30 so it's one of those kind of places where you can go and basically make it home in time to catch the last trains and whatnot so pretty decent We'll definitely be checking it out myself sooner rather than later. We'll definitely be checking it out myself. Moving on from that, we have news here courtesy of... Should we talk about that one? Move there. No, let's, let's talk about this. Let's move to this one. Let's go to this. I thought this might be quite interesting to actually speak about. I know these are probably going to be a bit marmite and many people won't like them, but... I have to be honest, I know Mischief do a lot of crappy shoes and they're not the most creative brand in the world. Everything's a little bit redundant and reductive. Well, redundant, redundant, or reductive, what's the word? Everything's a little bit repetitive, like you've kind of maybe seen it before. Um, it's a little bit bait, it's a little bit corny. But let's be honest, these shoes that Bloody, Bloody Orisis is, um, Osiris, sorry, is uh, modeling in this shoe where they basically did a flip on the whole uh, brace thing that you're meant to wear when you break or fracture your leg these days instead of having a cast. It's pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. There is something intrinsically good about how these look. And I know I shouldn't like them. I know they're very... Whatever is adjacent to fuckboy in terms of that kind of style of clothing, but I'm into them. I'm not going to lie. I'm really, really, really into them. Um, they look incredibly ridiculous. I'm sure the way bloody Osiris is wearing them is making me like them more, and they probably will not end up looking like that when I end up wearing them myself, but I can't help but want to try to see if it's possible to make these look good. I really can't 
help but try. And uh, I think they're actually available now on the site. What they're called? They're called the Mischief AC1. And they're available to purchase right now at the moment. And they look really cool. Who said medical equipment um, was never meant to be fly? And they've got like an actual rubber saw at the bottom of them, so it's not completely plastic. They've got a bit of a sole on them too, so they're a bit elevated. Um, when triggered, choose flight. Uh, the Mischief AC1 injury is in. Health is out. <laughs> I love it. Now you can look broken while still being whole. Strap into these boots and run as fast as possible. Stand as pedestrians. Jump higher than you've ever dreamed. Ascend your reality. They're supportive. They're soft to the touch and they're hard as fuck. The Mischief AC1 malingering. What's that? Malingering has never felt so luxe. That's a good point though, because most people will think you actually broke your foot, but here you are dancing, raving, jumping around, and acting like an absolute loon. So it's actually quite a cool little twist on something that you commonly associate with being broken, but you're actually pretty much okay. Um, I just love the up. I love the design of them. They kind of remind me of like a what's that Marty McFly shoe? A little bit, right? In terms of the design, they kind of remind me of like a late 90s basketball sneaker too. They've got that kind of vibe to them. And I just like how they look. This bit of the front here with their exposed sock thing, I'm not really a big fan of. I would have liked that to be a bit covered, but I guess it needs to kind of resemble an actual boot that you put on when you are injured. But the toes popping through at the front there, I'm not a fan of, especially if you get them in the size a little bit too big. You're gonna have your toes flapping on the front you know, or like a bad B. So that's not something that I kind of want in that regard. But let's see how much they actually go for. I think they're like 400 quid, right? Or is it, what are they? 450, oof. They're not cheap in the slightest way possible, are they? So you can buy them in a size 11 already now, my size already available to purchase. And they're 450. Um, it says, what's this here? The, the, the listing says, help, I broke my foot, but I look so good. Don't lie. The first time you ever saw someone wearing one of these, you thought they looked incredible. Industries with little to no regard for aesthetics, designing objects for utilitarian purposes, churn out bangers like no one else. We've collectively aesthetified ast glasses. We've, yeah, ast uh, aesthetified glasses but the trend of functional medical accessories um making the leap to the fashion seems to have lagged no longer this is the push and the envelope of what foot there is footwear should be anything that you wear on your feet i love that the materials are flexible molded construction mission patented while comfy technology for the unrivaled it'll be pretty gnarly to wear these and also have a face mask right walking down flipping central london somewhere people will be thinking oh no he broke his foot and he's got covid do you know what I mean? Or he broke his foot and he's scared of getting sick, like double whammy. But I'm a fan of these, man. The Mischief AC1s I'm a big fan of. I wonder if they'll continue doing more of these and you'll see AC2s, AC3s, 4 5s going forward. That'd be pretty gnarly as they kind of expand and take it further. But I really like these. I think they look cool. It'd be even extra cool if these could actually double up as braces as well. Like for if you actually did injure your foot and you wanted to wear one that wasn't as clunky looking as the medical one, you could wear these. I wonder if that's an actual thing. I guess not because you're not, meant to just put, you're not meant to put too much pressure on your leg when you are actually injured like that. But I do like what they look like, man. They look pretty cool. And I would definitely wear them. And I like the fact that they're not actually in different colors. They're actually in the same sort of like um, color that you would get them if you got the legit thing. So it's that kind of grayish, um, you know, hospital kind of color. That sort of color that's not red, it's not necessarily and that's interesting too the mix because the color is devoid of any kind of personality any kind of style any kind of pizzazz but the way they've been made in terms of the design it kind of gives it that pizzazz and that kind of wow factor so that's quite cool i have to be honest that's really really cool but yeah big up mischief um i do like these i do actually like these i'm not going to lie then moving on, we've got some news about some Bape gloves that I had no idea were flipping coming out. And I'm absolutely pissed off that I didn't know, to be honest. Most of you will know I'm absolutely obsessed with Bape, especially Bape during the Nigo days, which is what, whatever he launched it to, what, 2013, 14 or something. I think I forgot the time when Nigo was kind of kicked out of his own company. But essentially, Bape and Ape has been something that I've kind of worn from the very beginning of me getting into streetwear. The brands i wore when i started wearing streetwear sort of stuff or being into the scene was the hundreds fresh jives um diamond supply bape supreme um what was the other one i used to wear also 
Uh, and that was it, really, isn't it? Yeah, those are the main ones I usually wore. So Bapes actually got a special play for heart because that was the one that kind of opened my eyes to the whole Tokyo scene, the Urahara scene, Harajuku, um, all those select stores that were coming up during that whole time. It opened me up to a whole bevy um, of those sort of brands. So Bapes always going to have a special place in my heart. And as you guys know, as I purchased recently the Supreme Iraq uh, mechanic gloves that I purchased... I've obviously kind of been beaten up and wearing every single day and now it looks like Babe have also collaborated with Mechanics for another pair of gloves that are more akin to the plain ones I have at the moment where are they yeah I have like a plain pair actually now that I sometimes wear from time to time they're all black like this and they also you know similar to the ones you saw maybe Sting wear back in the day also or something is that because it's showing there on the screen yeah you see that but I was I had a blue pair that I lost in Primark, unfortunately. I think I left it on a stand somewhere and someone just went, whoop, swiped him straight away. But yeah, these are pretty cool as well. So I guess the Bape ones are based on that sort of model, but they look like they might have a little bit of a softer inside bit and they look like the outside might also be a bit softer, a little bit more of this sort of material, whether this material, or maybe I think actually this material that they use on the Iraq gloves, which is kind of like a neoprene type feel type thing. I think they use it because that's the only material they can actually print designs and stuff on. They can't unfortunately guess print designs on whatever this sort of like material is because it's got little lines on it as well, right? As you can see there. But it would be cool if they could do that because I think this would be a far better look to print it on because there's something about this material that kind of feels a little bit a little bit cheap. I don't know. I know it's not but it feels like a little bit digital print sort of stuff. But anyway, regardless. This is the collaboration um, because of the BAPE website. It says the BAPE and is releasing a collaborative item with Mechanics Wear, a glove brand established in 1991 and supported by all craftsmen, including motorsports. Um, this, in this collaboration, BAPE signature first camo is applied to Mechanics, the original um, available in green and yellow. The collection will be available on BAPE.com in October. Da, 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 da. But as you can see, you've got the first and you've got the yellow camera obviously that's the first camera that most people are aware of the kind of classic one with the bait head somewhere subtly in place there and you've also got the same thing on the yellow the only thing that i don't like about them is that i would have wished like on one part of the tab or maybe some of the straps here there'd be a little bit more of a bait logo in terms of a bait thing maybe like a you know the back of or maybe that bait head sort of logo where you got on the shirts where one way it was facing front on the back of the back of the head maybe that would have been quite cool but the only sort of motif you've got on them to kind of separate them from regular mechanics covers obviously the camo print because you're going to get them in the stores and the inside palm of the glove itself they've got these like raised because i don't have them on mine mine's just plain on the inside but they've got this sort of like raised jelly sort of thing that's meant to be a grip but they've used that to kind of draw the bape sort of head logo which is quite a cool little flip on that i'm not gonna lie so you got that there right and then on the inside what's the open the glove see when you open the glove you've got this kind of cool little bape logo thing on the inside which is i guess doubles up as a grip thing but i also kind of shows you the bape head there and it's sort of a shadowy type effect but yeah these are cool these are something i'd wear automatically with the bape snowball jacket you know the classic snowball jacket that i'm obsessed with that i still have on my grailed list um that i want to obviously recop sooner rather than later but this looks really really cool and i'm kind of gutted i didn't know about it sooner rather than later but regardless it feels like um people are making so many collaborations with gloves obviously you've got the supreme ones you've got these you've got the batting gloves that came up before then you've got these again then there's another one too i saw i wonder if this is like a weird kind of um larping thing like a cosplay thing like guys because life is so easy nowadays are basically trying to pretend like they actually work and do some sort of physical labor job so the best way to connect it's like when people used to wear like car hot chore jackets and shit right and dickies and put pens and stuff in there flipping pockets and stuff and little notepads or field note things it kind of feels like you know there's a weird need to feel useful to feel handy to feel like you know you have some sort of a you know skill that was outside of sending emails and knowing how to you know do layers on photoshop and shit i think there's something in it i don't know maybe i'm just you know smoking something but i don't know there's definitely something there but regardless love them like the look of these bait gloves and hopefully i shall get them soon myself hopefully i shall get them soon myself
Moving on from that, we have now official images of the neck face and Nike Dunk SB Lows. And these might be the first Dunk SB Lows from all the ones that have come out recently. And there's been a flood of them, it feels like. Every day they keep releasing more and more. These might be the ones I kind of will make an effort to cop. Maybe these and there was a pair of concepts I saw that were kind of in a white color that were really nice. So the sort of concept lobster type theme they're going for. And there was this weird sort of like jellyfish white kind of color that had this weird shimmer on it i saw recently they look absolutely hard but in general i kind of did the whole dunk thing when dunks you know sbs were really raging and all the rage in the 2000s and i kind of find it hard to kind of dive back into them again but sometimes you see a colorway and you see something that you like and you're a big fan of and these for me growing up in the area that i did in streetwear neckface was one of the you know main sort of artists people were collaborating with but i always liked his work in general and i always thought he should have had maybe a, a an SB sooner or maybe should have done something more with SB in general over the years but I do like what he's done with these in terms of applying all these patches that he obviously designs and patches that he probably had on his jacket back in the day those little jean sleeveless things that all these fucking hardcore guys like to wear or dudes you might bump into blondies will probably put on and I like that he's applied the same thing onto the dunks and essentially covered the entire shoe in badges to the point where you can't even see the swoosh and they had to include a little swoosh here I'm sure that's what somebody from the design team said hey we need to have some of our branding on here because he's covered the entire thing with these badges all over the place and stuff and i wonder if you could actually rip the badges off and put them on clothes i'm assuming you can right so that'd be pretty cool to see someone just rip badges off maybe off one shoe and put them all over their jacket or some shit or maybe they might come with some in the actual box itself but i like it man like loads of these cool illustrations on these badges and it's just a basic black and white upper shoe white midsole black outsole nothing crazy no other crazy white accents apart from that little swoosh on the inside of the shoe oh no it's there on the left hand side only it looks like there's like a little swoosh here on the left hand side towards the back of the heel tab and if i'm looking at it a little bit it looks a little bit like it might be denim it doesn't look like it's all suede or leather it looks like that back heel tab looks like it might be denim or corduroy here but yeah all completely black on black I wonder how many edits and round twos yet to go with the Nike designers before he convinced them that yes, all I want is a black and white SB. I don't want anything else. Like nothing looks crazy. But if anything, I would say, just as an aside, uh, it does come with some stickers or late or tags as well, badges, I think extra. Just an aside, am I the only person that thinks these would have looked far better on a dunk high or even a mid? I know mids are a little bit blasphemous, but I think this design would have worked perfectly on a dunk high or mid personally for me. But obviously I understand how popular dunk lows are um, and they're just probably selling them by the truck loads. That's probably why Nike decided to give him a dunk low or maybe he wanted one. But I don't know, I get a feeling that Nike probably said, hey, if you're going to do a black and white shoe and stick loads of badges over it, we have to have you just do it on a dunk low. No, you know, no other choices there. But I also like the fucking tab, which is something I mentioned before these days. But when I was growing up and collecting shoes for the first time, it was really rare to see a brand do the colorway and also be able to change the label or the heel tab or whatever else that's usually kind of um comes as stock when you're designing a shoe but at this to these times you know it, not only do they let you design a colorway they also allow you to apply all these what do you call it, appliques or accessories or add-ons or whatever maybe um you can get to change the labels the font even on the labels everything is going to be edited in that regard so i quite like that that's something that exists nowadays it's not just like a one-way thing of like oh just change these particular panels it's not it's more than nike id basically and i like that i think they look pretty cool i like how they look and again i can't wait for these to eventually come out i'm actually going to make an effort to purchase those when they do eventually hit the stores neck face dunk lows moving on moving on from that i want to speak quickly about this before oh let's speak about this let's talk about this actually so this is courtesy of high snobiety and it's a little feature um a sponsor story so it's not anything to kind of write home about but it features my guy here in preston somebody that i've always been a big fan of somebody who i was lucky enough to meet a very very long time ago when he used to do his blog and when i used to have my blog called stop begging that i essentially jacked his entire theme off of if you remember my blog you remember that i possibly did steal his entire theme of what his blog looked like to do mine i'm actually going to try and get it up on your screen here so i can maybe show you what i mean let me see if i can get up on art is it archive right how do you do archive sites let's see i think it's archive sites but let me see if i can get it up i'm pretty sure 
I can get it up on my old website here. I think it was called agostina.co.uk or something lame like that. And it was on a blog spot or a blogger. And like an idiot, I'm pretty sure I deleted it, like on the back end. So a lot of my posts and my writings have unfortunately gone the way of the dodo. But let me see if I can get um, a snapshot of it on the past so you can definitely see what it looked like before. But I essentially did copy what Heron Preston did on his website and just kind of jacked his theme of what he did. So you can see how much I was kind of looking up to the guy and trying to emulate the things that he was doing in my own little kind of way. And back then I was probably doing it because I was actually out. I did care about things a lot more than I do now. I was kind of out trying to impress and make friends and connections shit. And nowadays, you know, I couldn't care less. But this is a snapshot taken from 2010 February. Let's see if it's got the theme overall so you can maybe see. Because if you're around then you'll know what, you, when you see my theme, you'll know exactly what I took from here and back in the day. But let me see if you, if it kind of loads up. It's loading up now in the background. I don't want to put on screen before it takes. Yeah, there we go. This is definitely it. And if you know, you know. So this is definitely taken um, from Heron's kind of uh, blog and what he was doing back in the day. And I kind of did my quote unquote flip of it and how he had the flicker rolled into the banner on the side and the pictures would always rotate or they'd automatically generate different ones. My flipping old flicker account there, Tronics my old name on the forums back in the day, loads of posts about stuff I was doing back then. So clearly you can tell I was um, already infatuated with a guy and doing my own thing to kind of pick you off the back of it. But one thing that I thought was funny about this, just to kind of speak about was that this is obviously a story that he did um, tying into, what's the watch brand? I'm not familiar with the watches. Um, Audemars, Audemars Pigot, Pigot Audemars or APs as people usually call them in raps and shit and he's doing this cool little story right with them and clearly it seems like they're kind of gearing up for a creative collaboration sometime in the future we're definitely going to be able to see that <laughs> but I was wondering here in this interview did they mention Kanye West's name here let's see because okay nothing of West here let's see if they did yay no employed and other words but nothing to do with yay the funny thing i want to mention about this overall was that i think we need to give heron preston his props this story aside because it's basically a fluff piece and a brand piece we don't necessarily need to care about that too tough but congratulations to him and i can't wait to see what watch he ends up making with ap because i'm sure it's going to look absolutely amazing especially if he puts his little heron preston twist on it but we need to give this guy props for staying completely out of the whole Kanye drama he has done nothing in terms of making a statement he's done nothing in terms of putting his hand up and offering a word you know trying to in trying to basically um what's that word called translate or trying to basically offer a different opinion or just basically trying to offer a different side you know alleviate people's fears he's done absolutely nothing he's just kept on designing he's just kept on sharing his stuff that he's doing i saw a post recently where he shared a post of one skater kid wearing his 3d printed shoes at a skate park and it the first time you know 3d printed shoes has been worn at a skate park blah 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 and he's essentially just pushing his brand out there and not paying any mind to the whole kanye thing even though this guy is intrinsically linked to kanye in the same way that you would think you know a anyone else associated with him would be who was kind of spoken up now i don't want to mention people's names i don't want to get them involved too but it just needs to be said his ability to stay out of the drama his ability to just not get involved and kind of mind his business is something that's admirable and i think it's interesting because some people could argue that heron was the master and the kind of you know the champion of mining other people's business back in the day he was always really curious his blog was always kind of like you know it felt like a a really kind of a diary of somebody who was trying to find their way through the scene trying to figure stuff out asking loads of questions tapping people like he, to the point where he even was willing to sit down with me back in the day when i'm you know just doing my thing and being a bit of a nobody and hanging on and whatnot and he was kind of interested to kind of speak to me in that regard so clearly clearly uh, this is somebody that's clearly curious and plugged in so for him to kind of go out of his way to not get involved with the Kanye, you know, anti-Semitism stuff or just talk in general about anything to do with it just shows, kind of says a lot about him and maybe is a really good lesson for kids coming up in terms of how to navigate the scene. Because I've seen this post courtesy of Pharrell 
that kind of bummed me out a little bit, right? Because he's clearly trying to um, distance himself from Kanye and trying to make it known that he's not supporting any of Kanye's comments. But essentially, this post that he posted on his Instagram story where he reshared a post from somebody else, it's not even his own post that he actually typed with his own fingers. It's something that he reshared and it says um, words on a, on a square screen. Um, I support my Jewish friends and the Jewish people, which is a bit of an empty statement. It doesn't actually say, say, say anything. It's the most vogue, it's the most vagus of the vagues. It's up there with that black square during Black Lives Matter protest, but it does nothing to really further the question, the conversation. And it also does nothing to really draw a line in the sand because all these people essentially, for the most part, um, don't really want to come out, especially the prominent people within the scene or the industry, don't really want to come out and say anything kind of like final or kind of out there about Kanye because they know how that ends. Look at what happened to Ambush. Look what happened to, you know, to flipping Tremaine and stuff. If you come out there hard at him, he's definitely going to be willing to fight back and get back at you. And also they don't want to spoil or kind of tarnish their relationship with the guy because they're all probably feeling like how Adidas feel where they're, they're hoping this will pass and soon he'll be on his apology tour, Kanye, you know, now he's on his bigotry tour, but they're hoping soon the apology tour will come and he'll see sense and he'll see the way and everyone will be back to making money and sucking clout from him. That's essentially what they're doing because I refuse to believe, I refuse to believe that this Kanye is a new version of Kanye. There were elements of this guy's personality that existed back in the day when everyone was sucking him off and helping him design invitations for Yeezy and doing all this sort of stuff and being happy to be at the Wyoming show and showing off that they were there and wearing the shirt and showing the invites and all this kind of clout chasey stuff and, you know, that people do in general. People are willing to suck off and show and big up their relationship with him. But now he's spiraling out of control and doing things to offend a huge swaths of people no one wants to say anything because they don't want to ruin their reputations. Or if they are saying stuff, they're saying what Pharrell's saying, which is just these vague um, nonsense kind of like wordy statements that don't really mean anything. So it might be actually helpful and beneficial for your career if you just do like Heron Preston and just keep your mouth shut because there's nothing really you can add to the conversation. If I remember correctly, there was a time maybe a few months ago, maybe a couple of years ago, where I remember Heron going on this rant on his not rent but he kind of said a few things that might be to do with his real life and he basically said what's the effect of mind your business in life just mind your business just whatever you do focus on you and mind your business because there's so many distractions out there and so many things that you should be people say you should get involved in or lend your ear to but they don't really concern you in the slightest and i think this has been something that he's kind of adopted in terms of his uh, modus operandi because I'm assuming he was very aware of the people he was working with and their controversial opinions and how they stood in culture. And instead of being that person that's people go to as like, oh, what do you think of your friend Virgil? What do you think of your friend Kanye? He never said any of that stuff. He kind of kept stirring and just kept it moving. Even the Virgil stuff, only after his passing really, did I hear her and really share a lot of stories about Virgil and really kind of be out there talking about him often. He just, you know, that was his real life friend, but he didn't feel the need to kind of be the mouthpiece for the Donda guys or the Yeezy guys. He just kind of kept himself to himself in that regard. So maybe this is something that people should adopt. And I think, again, it's admirable because the pressure must be excruciating, do you know what I mean, on their side of things to kind of say some things, you know, there's, you, I'm sure there's WhatsApp, there's group chats going around. There's probably some crazy comments going around too, but my man is keeping focused he's selling all these archive of his rare sneakers on the auction raising money he's talking to flipping Odomar Pigo however you pronounce them and obviously that's kind of gearing up for a collaboration coming up in the future and then on top of that he's also showing 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 hair and Preston spring summer 2023 um which obviously looks pretty decent and again i feel like it's an improvement each season on what he's doing and you know i may be a hp cock guzzler but i think in general those guys in that group don't get enough credit for basically being untrained novice amateur designers designing on the highest level just think about it from jerry lorenzo to matthew williams to heron preston 
to God bless the dead Virgil Abloh, they were all people with no formal training in fashion, no going to flipping fashion school and pinning stuff and doing pattern cutting and interning here, doing whatever. No, it's all basically stuff that they've learned by osmosis and stuff that they've learned from fucking fucking around on Photoshop and printing stuff with a heat press and printing stuff with a screen printer. And it eventually led to this point. So if anything, these guys are incredibly inspiring. And I feel like if you're a kid coming up, whatever you decide to do, doesn't you don't need to make clothes but you can't help but look at this and not be inspired because of where they came from and because of the level that they're operating at it's just incredible and like i said i feel like each hp collection look at the first to this stuff stuff has really improved and you know me knowing him briefly for a short period of time and also being a fan from outside in i can definitely say he's one of the people that surprised me the most because i never saw Perrin Preston's a fashion guy at all he was maybe more of a style guy maybe more of a communication culture marketing ideas guy but I never really saw him or conceptual ideas in Africa I never saw him kind of presenting his ideas through the medium of clothes in this way if anything I saw him similar to something that I'm sort of like trying to emulate which is more like of a Tom Sachs approach where like you have your ideas that could be applied to clothing but they could be applied to furniture they could be applied to installations it could be applied to sculptures right do you know what I mean you can apply it to different sort of mediums but I didn't think I thought he was going to go down that route especially when he started doing that concrete block stuff and Monarch, all that sort of stuff you know the massive wooden table all these kind of cool things that he did that what that clock that he designed to but to go from that and to be presenting legitimate collections of clothes is pretty impressive like look at this stuff this double knee pant with the kind of chore jacket type vibe this is legit as they come with the nice gloves on it's maybe a little bit reductive, a little bit repetitive. Maybe you've seen that from other brands before, but again, it's clean. It looks like it fits great and just looks amazing overall. Um, the only thing I'm an only bit annoyed about, I think, is HP. The pricing is just, oof, it's pretty steep, man. It's pretty steep. But I guess this terms of positioning, you want your stuff to be next to the Bottega Veneta's and stuff and Balenciaga's and whatnot. You want the people who work or who buy that sort of stuff to also see your brand and think of it in the same sort of light, but it's just the pricing is a little bit too crazy for me in my opinion um but again i love all of it has he actually got a diffusion line? i'm not really too sure if there's a diffusion line but regardless it looks really cool um i also do like that most of his shows are what is it co-ed they say right where in terms of gender mix so it's not women's and men's um i do like that offering in that regard also because like i said i'd never saw him as a fashion guy so the fact that he's able to present clothes in this way it's just cool um, I'm not too sure if I'll be comfortable wearing Preston Racing just above my cock, but you know, still regardless, I love that motorcycle jacket with those big baggy jeans and the boots. The styling is pretty decent also. I wonder if he's got a new stylist involved behind the scenes to work with or it's just, a, or just means the clothes have elevated to a point where this is some way important, but I love it, man. This spring 2023 collection looks absolutely banging. I'm not going to lie. Is he still doing that, that style thing on the collar? Oh, that's a little bit yeah the only thing i'm a little bit you know kind of over in terms of that style written in the russian celeric this the cut on this jacket looks pretty decent too it's got like a u type shape here which is quite nice that kind of reveals that basketball logo on the shorts look number 16 17 nice as well graphics with a flame on it some nice big gloves. These motorcycle gloves, whatever they got with these exposed knuckle bits are pretty sick. Hopefully they're HP and not like a stock things he bought somewhere, but these are really nice. I like those. The shoes are pretty decent too. They remind me a little bit of triple S's, but I like the look of them. And they got HP and Y as a, as a hat. Kind of got the twist on DK and Y. I wonder why um, DK and Y didn't kind of settle with him long term in terms of the rebrand and taking over that brand in general was it calvin klein maybe it was calvin klein i forgot which one was it calvin klein people might have been calvin klein my bad not dk and why um he should have maybe took over it full, full time going forward the heron person shirt's nice as well heron sports sorry i think he would have been definitely a better fit for it going forward instead of somebody else but yeah pretty decent altogether pretty decent but like i said before the main lesson from this as well is saying it's impossible probably to design collections like this that are so cohesive, so well put together. Again, you don't need to like what he does, but you can't deny that this has definitely come from somebody who's concentrating. 
this doesn't come from somebody who's on Twitter and interacting with whatever topical fashion Twitter topic is on the day, um, whatever controversy is happening with their friends, whatever touchstone thing that's happening in the culture. This is somebody that's definitely focused, who's going to you know factories, who's going to their studio and slogging over the minor details like the ribbing on the jacket, the cuffs, the button selections, the weight of the you know the material, the finish on it. This is the kind of thing that happens when you focus. When you focus, you do these collections and you do flipping collaborations with AP which are clearly in the works like there's no doubt about it. you know he's sitting down here with somebody from sense talking about header creative and contents was he called tom beffridge right you see him he look he looks a little bit like what's his face in it does he look a little bit like i don't know there's a lot of white guys that look like that basically in it with the long hair and the and the face but yeah regardless um big up hp for minding his business i think more people should because there's not really much you can add to this conversation of yay really in it what more can you actually say that's actually going to further the conversation what other insights can you add that's going to give people an understanding of what's going on there's not really much that can be said or can be added so it's better just to kind of keep your counsel focus on you and hope hope by god that it all kind of blows away hope by god that it all blows away then moving on from that, I went to quickly touch upon this. Where is it? Where is it? I went to touch upon. I can't find it. This is it. This one. Oh, where is it? Yeah, there we go. This. So, this is courtesy of a, a account called Stay Grounded, right? And it says the following. It says, good to hear from you, bitch, and tremendous. Kanye West has filed two trademarks for in response to his ongoing feud with Train Emery. So that kind of back and forth he's having with Tremaine, which I obviously covered here on the podcast, Kanye is now going to step further and decided to trademark both of those sayings in that text message because I guess those are the things that people resonate with and were laughing at and were kind of having a little bit of a kiki, ha-ha moment with, which I clearly did have in that regard. But seeing that this is happening and then seeing how it's kind of evolved, going to Ian Connor's Instagram where he shared some pictures of stuff he's developing, it looks like with Kanye behind the scenes, it looks like they're putting out an entire line of tremendous line of tremendous stuff that's obviously a flip on Supreme because obviously the guy worked to Supreme. And I have to be honest, um, I feel like the joke is a bit tired now. I feel like it's a bit done, it's a bit, you know, boring. But I also feel like this is just lame and if anything is pretty dangerous not so dangerous but it's probably not the right great thing you'd want to do to your friend because essentially he's empowering his army of sycophants all over the world to basically you know keep on attacking and going after Tremaine at any point because they've essentially labeled him as an op as a, somebody that he needs to kind of take down somebody he needs to fight against and it's just ir ironic that he's going around talking about how Jewish people this Jewish people that and he's out here fighting his own brothers like legitimately people he used to work with and count as friends and collaborators he's now turned them into enemies to the point where he's making teachers about them and trying to diminish their power which might lead to them maybe selling less stuff and not being able to support themselves and their extended family it's really kind of hypocritical of him to do such a thing in my opinion but i don't really like any of this to be honest I, like i said i think it's lame i think it's tired it's boring i'm over it um you know these jokes are probably things you need to get out in the open and ready to sell quickly turn around type thing i wonder if there has been something said behind the scenes to kind of stop these from coming out legitimately because we haven't actually seen these in person or people buying buying, buying them sorry um Maybe they were made the same time they made the White Lives Matter shirt. So maybe, you know, Dove didn't want to give him anything to do with this in general because he didn't want to give him the White Lives Matter shirts either. But they did get hold of them because they gave them to the homeless people. But I'm not really sure what the deal was with these, to be fair, because they've kind of just disappeared. And we've not actually seen anything kind of concretely come out of it. But clearly, they're doing it. There's a picture here, Kels of Insta uh, Ian Connor's Instagram, where it shows some mock-ups of the shirts. You've got a Nate Lauman uh, mock-up of the shirt with the bullet holes and box logo. You've got the classic box logo, then you've got the purple box logo, which is really rare. And then you've got the box logo in the sky blue with the red box logo taken from uh, Tyler Creator's video for... Is it for She? with Frank Ocean, I think it's she, right? With Frank Ocean's like sitting in the garden, so I think it's she, I don't know which one it is, but regardless, you know, the flip and what it's about. And like I said, I feel like it's a little bit lame. It's a little bit dangerous and clearly it's something that I feel like is done to be a bit malicious to the guy and to not kind of, 
you know, it doesn't necessarily paint him in a good light. And the reason why I say this is because if you go on his Instagram account, especially for Denim Tears, it feels like the crowd has turned. And I don't feel like this is something that, ha you can't say this isn't because of how Kanye has been going at him. Now, forget all this stuff, because all this stuff is the hits. But if you go to the stuff that isn't containing the reefs, like this collection that uh, Tremaine, I guess, recently popped up or uploaded on his site, which is a collaboration with Sky High Farm Work, where which is inspired by the foods from Harlem, Georgia, Jamaica, Queens. The collection is christened with a tapestry of okra, collard greens, black eyed peas, and watermelon seed packets. Small community, massive dis diaspora, infinite details, releasing on the 21st or the 10th. You can't actually, you can't say he's doing this the easy way, Tremaine, innit? He's making really, really black centric, African American centric, whatever you want to call it, clothing. And you would imagine stuff like this would maybe ostracize people who don't uncomfortable wearing this type of stuff people who are non-black so he is only really appealing to a really small niche of a niche community or audience or customer base so this is clearly something that he's willing to take the risk for and i'm i, I got rated i got be honest i don't like all the stuff but the fact that he's really hyper focusing into this niche i think i forgot what he said the term of fucking dinner tears they got it here in the bio no, they don't have it, but there's a term, there's like a kind of line that he has that he kind of puts out there. I think it's clothing for the diaspora. I don't know, whatever it is. But if you go in the comments of this post, which features the Sky High Farm Workwear collaboration, you can see that the public has kind of turned on him. Outside of all the friends sucking him off and stuff, you can see that there's a, some friends. Is it this one or that one? I think that's the wrong one, actually. But I saw some posts of people basically being very critical and a little bit rude in what they were saying here. Okay, incredible, incredible, incredible. We love this. Let's go more down there. Maybe it was another post then. Okay, okay. do not buy from this company. Okay, cool, not that one. So maybe it was this. I think it might have been this post, actually, that shows the pictures, just the items just laid out flat. Yeah, there we go. This is the one. So as you got here, you've got this guy here saying, y'all could do so much better. You've got another person says, seems like it won't get any better than the cotton reef. And everyone one says, Thanksgiving fear. People are putting the trash emojis. And I've got a feeling this is all like, as a consequence of Kanye declaring war on the former collaborator and close friend. Um, to the point where now like the community, especially the these sheep and these hype these kids who can't think for themselves anyway, right? Until they see flipping Rocky wearing a pair of off white denim tears jeans, then they suddenly wanted the pair, but before that no one cared. So clearly these kids are very susceptible and easily influenced. And if someone like a Kanye is coming out here and basically telling you to tell telling you to call this guy tremendous and saying that his brand sucks, then it's no surprise that all these kids are going in these comments and trying to you know, put smut on the kid's name. And obviously the emojis there, says, yeah, I'm transitioning from a career in social work. Can I pay $7 for the green wall with a sweatshirt? Nah, bruh, really question mark. What the fuck? How you bird to remain? This ain't it. And I think a lot of it has come off the back of what Kanye said, because I don't think this is any different than what he's always been doing in terms of his output. And it just feels like it's a better quality stuff. The collaborations are a little bit, you know, well, maybe more frequent or whatever it may be, but I don't think there's anything different than what them two was putting out before. And, it, you know, it gets even worse if you click on this picture of these new jeans that are meant to be coming out. Some roof off on a Trojan horse. Virgil came back through the boy. People are saying here, said we've had enough getting old really fast. Another one says here, yeah, really old designs. Can you ship my shit out? Making money of Virgil, that's tremendous. Put an A inside a circle, game changer. <laughs> yeah, people are clearly saying some really harsh and negative things. And like I said, I feel like this is definitely as a consequence of Kanye's, you know, irresponsible rhetoric that he's putting out there where he's essentially trying to dunk on his friends and make them look horrible in front of the public. And clearly it's working for some people in it. Um, but again, like I said, it's an unfortunate situation altogether. Hope they do reconcile in some cases and get over it because they are all stronger together. In my opinion, stronger together. Okay, let's move on from that. Let's talk about this. Have you seen this? Courtesy of WWD Magazine, but I also got the news courtesy of NSS Mag, who broke the news actually five days before, I think, or maybe a week before, so big up them. But it looks like Balenciaga have officially severed ties with Kanye West. They have broken off that long-lasting collaboration of 
customer and brand and collaborator and fan whatever it may be right they've broken that relationship up especially in a professional sense maybe Kanye and Debna are fans or friends behind the scenes but as a brand they can't be seen together in that malarkey and if you're Demna, you're probably not going to want to be seen next to him anyway. It probably does help that he loves, he lives in flipping St. Petersburg. Oh, where's the St. No, Petersburg? Uh-uh. Where is it again? Whatever the capital of Switzerland is, I forgot the name of it. But um, that's where Demna lives. So it's probably easy for him because he gets to avoid these kind of conversations because he's not in Paris, he's not in LA. It makes it easy to avoid people like this in general if they if the bosses do come in and say, hey, you can't talk to him anymore. But this is courtesy of WWE magazine. It says, Blaine Shocker is severed ties with Ye. Following the publication of his uh, third quarter results on Thursday, parent company Carrying said the French house would no longer be working on projects with the rapper formerly known as Kanye West, who has been increasingly controversial public comments in recent weeks, including anti Semitic threats. Blaine has no longer a relationship with any plans to work in the future related to this artist. They even say his name. Carrying said in response to a query from WWD, it did not elaborate further. The stronger singer opened the summer 2023 show and held in a mud pit during Fashion Week, wearing what looked like battle gear, including a branded mouth guard shield in his teeth. The image was removed from Blenshaga's website. It's also been moved from the video also. Um, it was the latest collaboration with Blenshaga Artistic Dem- this director Demna following the launch of earlier this year, the Yeezy Get Blenshaga line, which dropped from February in tandem with the Yeezy with the Kanye Don the Two Experience performance in Miami. Demna served as creative director for the earlier listing event for the album last year. The designer also has a strong relationship with Ye's ex-wife, who appears in advertising campaigns for Blenshaga and her extended family sisters, Kylie Jenner and Chloe Kardashian, who attended the Blenshaga show in October the 2nd. So it kind of feels like similar to what happened at Louis Vuitton, when essentially Louis Vuitton chose the brand friendly PG version of Kanye in Virgil, God Bless the Dead, and Kanye got pissed off about that. It feels like Blanchard are choosing the Kardashians as, you know, they're choosing to lie in the bed of the Kardashians whether, instead of lying in the bed of, the, of Kanye because they're a lot more predictable, they're a lot more safe than what Kanye is, even though they're probably as controversial in the public and whatnot. So the same thing is happening itself, you know, history basically repeating itself. And in a way, what you can say with this happening again and again is that the common denominator, the common factor in this whole thing that stays consistent is who? Yay. Kanye West. He's the one person that stays consistent. So really, if you were a smart person, if you were a reasonable person, if you were somebody that was capable of reflection and personal responsibility and accountability, you would look at it and say, you know what? Maybe I'm the problem here. Everyone keeps getting deals. Everyone keeps having these long lasting professional relationships, but I always kind of find a way to fuck them over, fuck them up. I find a way to, you know, leave or it just doesn't work out for me. They don't give it to me because as much as Kanye lets go on about, oh, I was promised a Louis Vuitton job and they denied it at the board. Why do they think they denied it at the board? Because he's been a controversial figure and he probably says some things to upset certain people and they ended it in the same way that, there was that story or no, I think Kanye during one of his rants said something or he was sharing pictures of the board at Adidas and one of the people at Adidas who didn't like him, who he had some beef with, some um, Asian lady, happened to also be on the board of JP Morgan Chase. So it's no coincidence that when it came the time to vote him out and get his account locked down and taken away, even though he had 140 M's in it, as he said, they were quick to do it because he pissed off the wrong people. So for whatever reason, Kanye doesn't seem to know how to do that side of things he doesn't know how to manage those relationships and make it work i think the last time he did it properly in that kind of scale was maybe louis vuitton if i remember they saw out their contract legitimately i think it was three years whatever how long it was they saw it out completely with no real kind of kicking up or, you know kicking off the furniture or throwing stuff out the window um, but nowadays he just doesn't seem to be able to do it it continues yeah, last month terminated his partnership with Gap Inc., signaling an increasingly combative attitude that also left his 10 year old relationship with Aiders hanging by a balance. The German sportswear firm said on October 6th the partnership was under review. The rapper who was diagnosed with 2016 with bipolar disorder has appeared in Spiral Out of Control since staging a surprise user show in Paris that features a shirt with the word slogan White Lives Matter. Da, 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 da. But anyway, let's go back to the Blanchard thing. The thing that's really annoying and really pisses me off about this issue is that in general, it does kind of expose how, um, f- I wouldn't say flaky, but how flip-flop these guys are in general. Because I, like I've said before, I honestly refuse to believe as just a regular civilian watching these things from the outside in, I refuse to believe this version of Kanye is new. 
I think us as fans will maybe shielded by this because a lot of his friends and close collaborators would never speak about the fractious times they've had with him or when they've seen him bark on people or just be rude in general. They don't necessarily like to repeat those things. They want to protect the mystery. They want to protect their connect. They want to make sure they get invited to listening parties. They want to make sure they get the free free shoes and post. Because if you notice, no one's posting their free shoes anymore. No one's saying thanks, Kanye. Everyone's kind of keeping themselves to themselves and you know even if there was a show announced they'd all go out of the way to pretend like they had a talk with him and gave him a dressing down all this malarkey but in general i feel like a lot of these people have enabled the guy even though he's you know he's to blame largely for everything that's happening that he's saying but a lot of it i think is because of an unchecked ego and obviously you know when people do try and check him i'm sure he probably just tells them to fuck off and gets new friends who can agree with him but I think all those years of, you know, blowing smoke up his ass and making him feel like he's untouchable, it's no surprise that he's walking around like, guess what? He's untouchable. So maybe this Blanchard thing would be quite a big body blow, especially on the back of the air, uh, what he shared on, on Instagram ages ago of him allegedly spending up to $4 million on Blanchard. And this was this calendar year. It wasn't even from last year. It was from like the January 2022 until now. So mid-October or late October. He spent $4 million. Now, of course, you know, Belichick's stuff is not cheap. You know, a t-shirt is going to go for, what, 400 quid or something. So clearly you can rack up the spend pretty quickly. But the fact that he spent $4 million and that didn't give him any leeway, any protection. It didn't give him any opportunity to have a conversation with Karen and maybe explain his position or maybe even apologize so he can keep the bag. Nah, four million is not enough. In the same way, having one forty million in the bank isn't enough either. They chucked him out of the bank. They cut him off for the bench I think, even though he's clearly somebody I feel like who, you know, even though I'm familiar or I'm in love with them, not familiar, even though I'm familiar with them and I know about him since very Mondays and, I, you know, I was wearing the collection since the first collection on the runway and I've been obsessed with the guy ever since and I loved everything that he's did at Blanchard so far. You still have to say, Kanye was definitely the person who brought Blanchard to the masses, especially when it comes to the black community. He definitely is the one that kind of propped it up and made it a little bit, made it bang a little bit more than it probably would have before. So this definitely is going to hurt, even though he probably will say different. I'd imagine, you know, having such a brand on your back and then suddenly not having them anymore is not something that you're going to be taking lightly. But, you know, again, who do you have to blame on this? Just himself, really, to be honest. Only, 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 only himself and nobody else. Here's off too much. But thanks again for listening. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking out the show via the podcast app, you know what to do. Share it, download it and all that stuff. That'd be greatly appreciated. And of course, leave me a five-star review or a four-star or a three or two or one. I don't mind. Just leave me a review so people know that people are checking out the show and they like and enjoy it. And hopefully that will also go a long way to helping me secure sponsors sponsorship and stuff going forward so i can go bloody full time with this malarkey but if you're watching for youtube also make sure you smash the like hit subscribe and all that good stuff and leave me a comment down below let me know what your thoughts and feelings were or the things that i spoke about and all that good stuff and as per usual if you listen to the audio version of the podcast you'll hear my tune of the day and if you're watching through youtube you want to hear jack crap and you'll just fade to black peace